So we've talked quite a bit about microevolution, which is small changes to the genetic variants of a population. And this is something that we can see quickly, maybe over a couple generations or maybe in a little bit longer. But when talking about microevolution, we were talking about a single species and how that species was evolving and changing. And we really see this in every population on Earth. Related to evolution, another branch of evolution is macroevolution. And this term gets used interchangeably with speciation, and they're both referring to the same thing. So let's dive in. So if we take a look at evolution, you've seen um, this, this slide a couple of times now. We have that microevolution, so small changes in a population over time. But now we're going to focus on macroevolution, so evolution on a much larger scale. And this is looking at the creation of new species. So how did we get lions? How did we get penguins? How did we go from one common ancestor to this diversity of life that we see today? So macroevolution, if you want kind of a nice, you know, definition for macroevolution, it's just, it's essentially microevolution over and over and over again. It's an accumulation of traits over many, many generations that eventually leads to the rise of new species. So you might get small coloration changes, small behavioral changes, small mechanical changes, but as those accumulate more and more, you start seeing a distinction uh, between organisms within a population to, to eventually when we get to the point that we say, hey, that population is no longer like the others in its group, uh, that it's more, uh, much more different. We also refer to this as a divergent evolution. Earlier in this unit, we talked about convergent evolution, which is species coming together. And it wasn't they were evolving into each other. It was saying that, hey, they lived in similar habitats and Natural selection is acting on them similarly. This is why they have similar characteristics. But divergent evolution is the opposite. We have species diverging or going away from each other, that they're accumulating so many differences that they're, they're not the same anymore and they're actually quite different from one another. So macroevolution, divergent evolution, and speciation, all of these words, while they are different definitions, are fairly interchangeable, at least in the way that we're going to be using them in this class. So the idea of divergent evolution is that we have this kind of concept of a common ancestor. And we, and that might be humans, it could be birds, it could be insects, it could be sponges, whatever you want to look at, that those organisms evolved uh, from uh, from that common ancestor through the process of natural selection. So to give you an example that we at least see on the screen, and then I'll explain another example. This is looking at six uh, modern uh, apes uh, or chimpanzees or uh, primates is probably the better word for them. And so the six on top, they have a lot of um, common characteristics. Now they are different from one another but they do have a lot of common characteristics. And so this idea of divergent evolution is to say that, hey, we had some sort of early primate, something that's not around anymore. But from that early primate, some populations were using their tail more for transportation, uh, were using their size more uh, in sexual selection, were um, using their flexibility to get higher in the branches to get fruits more. And so within this early primate, there was variation within that population. And if you go time after time, generations after generations, what we start seeing is these populations splitting away from one another. They're, they are specializing in different things. And so there's a lot of different evidence for it. We're going to cover that uh, later on in this unit, but this is what the general idea is. You can look at a common ancestor of, say, primates. You can look at a common ancestor of all life on Earth, which is a bacteria. It's not that exciting. You can look at a common ancestor of mammals. So you can look at a common ancestor all along the way. With humans, we can look at a common ancestor um, Oh gosh, um, <laughs> looking back, um, a common ancestor that we might share uh, with apes. So it's not going to be common day apes. It's going to be, you know, apes that were around um, hundreds of thousands uh, and hundreds of millions of years ago. 
Now, before we dive into like how this happens, it's pretty important for us to understand what a species is. I keep saying speciation and we make a new species, but what does that mean? Now, if we were in a classroom, I'd have you guys think about this, that, you know, here I have a cat and I have a dog, and you probably know that these are different species. But my question to you is why? Why are they different species? What makes them a different species? Why is a cat not a dog? They have similar characteristics, right? They are both uh, meat eaters. They both have fur. They both have eyes. Um, their, their way they walk, uh, even the way they communicate is kind of similar. So what makes them different from one another? And if you want a definition, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now that this definition I'm about to give you isn't perfect. But the most common way that scientists will define a species is that it's a group of organisms that can breed with one another and create viable offspring. So for example, a cat and a dog, they, they can't breed with one another. And let's, let's just say hypothetically, they somehow did. They're not going to make a viable offspring. They're, they're not going to make an offspring uh, at all because they're so different from one another that their chromosomes aren't lining up. And more or less, if that were to happen, that embryo would self-destruct. So this is why a cat is not a dog, is that if they were to breed with one another, they can't create viable offspring. Now, I said before that this is the, one, the definition that scientists most use the most. You're going to find in this unit, it's not a perfect definition. There are almost just as many exceptions uh, as there are those that follow the rules. Remember, nature doesn't care about the labels that we as scientists put on things. Nature's not like, ha ha, this cat is a different species than a dog. Like, nature doesn't care about that. So we as scientists try to make these beautiful definitions of what's happening in the environment, but know that they're not 100% always accurate. Especially as scientists learn about new things, they sometimes blow holes in our definitions. But for this class, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to say species that are members of a group that can reproduce with one another and create viable offspring are considered to be part of the same species. I do want to show you another classic example real quick. Uh, so for example, horses and donkeys are considered separate species, but they can reproduce. They do create an offspring here. It's called a mule. It looks pretty much like the blend of both of these species. But the reason donkeys or horses are not considered the same species is that when they do create their offspring, when they do create mules, it's infertile. Mules cannot reproduce. Mules are sterile organisms. So yes, there's some weird things that happen in the environment. Humans you know, play a small part of that. But if that offspring isn't viable, if that offspring can't reproduce in and of itself, then we're not going to consider donkeys and horses to be the same species. Now, what we'll see a lot, not just in this class, but especially if you guys take microbiology, you've seen probably something very similar to this. Really, a lot of the courses that you take, especially in the biological sciences, you're going to learn about how we classify species. And so I have it listed here. Now, this is an image I took off the internet. So this very first one, life is not really considered a classification. Like, you don't be like, ah, oh, we are in life of life. Like, that... That's just what the internet showed. So ignore life. But domain is our highest classification. And what I mean by that is our domains are the first way we split organisms into groups. And that's essentially what this classification order is for, is to split organisms into groups that get more and more similar to one another. And I'll be showing you guys an example of this in a little bit. So the first one we have is domain. And something that I'd like to do is I'm going to tell you a couple different domains because these are words you're already familiar with. So for example, we've got eukarya. That's a domain. This includes all of the eukaryotes. We have things like bacteria. So, you know, we have eukaryotes, we have bacteria. Bacteria is a, uh, is a prokaryote. And then the third domain of life is archaea. 
Archaea are also prokaryotes, and we're going to explore all of these a lot more in this class. But again, the reason I list them here is so that you're becoming familiar with, oh, I know these terms. Well, now I'm telling you, okay, well, that's a domain, the highest form of classification in uh, the way we identify life and classify life. So if we go further down, so underneath domain, each domain has different kingdoms. Within each kingdom, there's multiple phyla. Phyla is the multiple of phylum. So I'll go ahead and write that out. So phyla. In the phyla, we have classes. In classes, we have orders. In orders, we have families. In families, we have genuses. <laughs> and within genus, we have species. Now it's important to understand how, um, how these relate to one another. You should know that a phylum is higher than a class and that an order is less than a kingdom. So knowing the order of these is critically important because if I say, hey, um, is uh, Canis, the genus Canis, is that more related to this or to this? And knowing where these classifications fall is really important. Now, everyone has different ways of memorizing it. I, I remember when I first memorized this, the way I did it is if you take the first letter of each word and you can create a mnemonic with it. And so what I use, and you, you can use this if you want to, you cannot use this if you don't want to, that's totally fine, um, is Dear King Philip came over for green spaghetti. And honestly, if you can remember that or whatever other one that you want to come up with, it becomes a lot easier to remember the order. Like, oh, Philip came. Okay, so phylum is before class. How you memorize it, completely up to you. That's personally, I mean, I still use that today. I don't even have this memorized because I'm always saying that sentence in my head when I need to use that. Now, you do not need to write what just popped up on the screen. This is showing you an example with humans. So humans are found in domain Eukarya. We are eukaryotes. We're in kingdom Animalia. You probably knew that, or at least you've probably heard of that. We're in phylum Chordata. This means backboned organisms. And we're mammals. And what's happening is that with each of these levels, you know, Eukarya also includes things uh, like plants and fungi and protists. Okay, well, when we go to Kingdom Animalia, we've just gotten rid of all those things. Now we're a little bit more closely related to other organisms in our kingdom. Well, we're in Phylum Chordata, so other things with a backbone. So now that we're narrowed down a little bit more, we're, we're not really related to insects. Insects don't have backbones. We're not really related to, um, of course, I'm going to blank on everything right now, but other things without a backbone. We're not related to lobsters and crabs. We go to class mammalia, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of fish, we're gonna get rid of birds, we're now just grouped with other mammals. And so what's happening as we get more and more narrow in our classification, you're starting to see what other organisms are similar to humans. So here in order, we're in order primates, okay? So things like gorillas and chimpanzees are also found here. Hominidae, these are more human-like or upright organisms. And then finally, uh, homo and then our species sapiens. Now you're probably thinking like, oh, homo sapiens, like I've, I've used that term before, I've heard that term before. So homo sapiens represents our scientific name. This is the name given to our species. And so when you refer to a species, you use its scientific name, which uses the genus and the species. So of that classification, it's a combination of both. So it's a combination of genus and species. The way you would write this, Homo sapiens, you notice with the species name, I am not capitalizing it. If I was a little bit fancier, what this should really look like, that should also be italicized. So an italicized Homo sapiens, the genus name being capitalized and the species name being undercased, and then all of that being italicized. So that would be for us as humans, that would be our species name or our scientific name. This type of naming system is called binomial nomenclature. The term binomial nomenclature is, is kind of redundant. So bi means two, nomial means name, and nomenclature means 
how to give names. So this means a to name how to give names. So every species on Earth has a scientific name made of the genus and species. As an aside, you might be like, yeah, but why would I be like, oh, look at that Homo sapiens over there. You would just be like, that's another human. This is really nice in the scientific world because this means that scientists from around the world can use the same exact single name for a species versus looking at all these different local names that organisms have. For example, um, there is this bird uh, found in North America called the Bobo Link, and then in South America, totally can't remember its name, it's called something completely different down there. And the bird molts, meaning it sheds its feathers, and it actually looks quite a bit different when it's migrating um, between North and South America. And it took a long time for researchers to realize that the bird in North America was the same exact bird in South America because they'd had different common names. So one person called it the Bobo Link, the other one called it the Black Banded Bird. Uh, and that's the problem with common names is that it's, it's come up with within a local language. It's come up with within a, a certain area. And what one person calls it is different than someone else. In the United States, lightning bugs versus fireflies. That would be an example of common names referring to the same species. So when scientists are writing uh, and publishing research related to a species, they'll always use a scientific name because that is the same everywhere in the world. That is how we can guarantee, hey, what they're talking about over here is what we have here as well. So it might seem trivial, like, okay, it's the genus and the species, uh, but really, really important when talking about science. So this last thing I'll show you, this is kind of showing you kind of that nesting structure of the species classification scheme. So domain being kind of the largest level, and you see it includes a lot of different things. As you narrow down with your kingdom and with your phylum and with your class, you see how we're eliminating species, so to speak. Now this is looking at the American black bear, and we are actually found in Eukarya. Humans are also found in Animalia. Humans are found in Chordata. Humans are found in Mammalia. But then this is where we diverged. Uh, so if we continue with our bears, they're in Carnivora, whereas us, we were in primates. And so again, this is just a kind of cool digital version of this cascading nature of the species classification. So that's where I'm going to leave you with this. So again, we're looking at macroevolution. So this idea that organisms are diverging or speciating from a common ancestor. You can look at the small scale or at the large scale. And we also talked about what a species is. Like, what do we mean by species and how do we categorize those species? So that's it for this video. The next video coming up is going to start talking about how does this actually happen? How do we have a common ancestor and how does it diverge into multiple species?